So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Africana Studies uh, Faculty Colloquium. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Dia Venton. I'm glad I see this because she added well, another part of the iteration of her uh, title, The Fever Archive, Race and Epidem Epidemiological Reason in a Time of Crisis. Now, her bio reads as uh, She's an associate professor of anthropology and African studies at Northwestern University, where she, she is affiliated with the Science and Human Culture Program. Her first book, HIV Exceptionalism, Development Through Disease in Sierra Leone, won the 2017 Rachel Carson Prize, which is awarded by the Society for Social Sciences and Social Studies of Science, the best book in the field of science and technology studies with strong social and political relevance. Her body of work addresses transnational efforts to eliminate health disparities and inequality and the role of ideology in public health. In addition to ongoing research on public health responses to epidemics, including the 2013 to 2016 West African Ebola outbreak, she has conducted research on the growing movement to fully incorporate surgical care in the common sense notions of global. Her other writing has touched on the politics of anthropological knowledge, and infectious disease outbreak response, racial hierarchies in humanitarianism and development, and techniques of enumeration and gender-based violence programs. She has a PhD in social anthropology from Harvard University, an MPH in international health from the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, and an AB in human biology from Brown University. She's held a postdoctoral fellowship at Dartmouth College and visiting positions at Oberlin College and in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I know it's one of those dreary days and um, and, well, there are a lot of things going on. Thank you, thank you, Carol, for all of your help in setting everything up. Um, I just wanted to um, preface this talk by, talk by sort of introducing um, what's going on here, which is that I'm, I've, I'm writing a book about the West African Ebola outbreak. Um, and I've been playing with a bunch of different um, methodologies and different uh, data sets to talk about this from a perspective that hasn't really been addressed, which is about the sort of racial underpinnings of public health um, and some of the other kinds of regimes that emerge under, or I think that um, are brought into relief in these intense crises like an outbreak of this magnitude. So I wanted to begin, as anthropologists do, with a story. On August 5th, 2014, Nancy Wrightwell became the first American, actually no, the second American evacuated to Atlanta from Liberia to be treated for Ebola. Accompanied by police and FBI escorts from Dobbins Air Force Reserves Base, Wrightwell was met by several attendants at the Emory University Hospital on Clifton Road. Does everyone remember this? Yeah, it was intense. So the ride to the hospital, while described by the authorities as uneventful, was a media spectacle that drew scorn towards the CDC, which is located on the same road, and it's only a few blocks away. So to hear Louise, the CDC Museum's curator, tell it, a sea of media were parked on the street as helicopters circled above the CDC in the hospital. She knew it was a historic moment worth documenting, and she had a plan. She would ask CDC employees who had been deployed to the Ebola-affected region to return with objects from their field work. Her voice lowered on the phone. This is a phone interview. She said, I wasn't going to let that happen again. What is that? So the that, I was going through my field, and I was like, what is this that she's talking about? And it referred to her failure to recognize the significance of the 1979 to 1981 Atlanta child murders and disappearances and their deep reverberations through the city's black, poor, and working class neighborhoods, all of which were, at the time, in the opposite pole of the city from the CDC's main campus. Why had that 
her failure to communicate, to, to document the murders of black children aged 9 to 14 years old, been her point of reference that day. Why was that the point of reference for her work documenting Ebola, which was an Ebola crisis that was unfolding in West Africa? So on its face, the link was quite simple. Louise arrived in Atlanta in the late 1970s from Boston and had worked for the city's historical society, collecting and cataloging materials of historical significance at the same time that two dozen black children, mostly boys, were reported missing or turned up dead in southwest Atlanta. Where was I when I was not collecting those materials? She asked me. At the time that we talked, some weeks after I had visited the museum's Ebola, People, Public Health, and Political Will exhibit in summer 2017, it seemed that she was simply referring to the challenge of recognizing contemporary history in the making, of tailoring and tethering museological and archival practice to the demands of a 24-hour, rapidly evolving news environment. But there was more to the story. Down in the basement of the CDC Museum, where the permanent exhibit, The Story of CDC, sits, is a section called A Public Health Approach to Violence. A diptych panel chronicles the role of the CDC in establishing violence as a public health problem with explicit reference to the period that a handful of C CDC epidemiologists assisted Atlanta police in their investigation of the Atlanta child murders. That Louise established a connection between the unsolved murders and disappearances of ch black children and the West African Ebola outbreak offers a generative way to think about how failure, about failure neglect, abandonment, anti-blackness, terror, and horror in the mnemonic institutions where she worked then and now. It compels us to think of the ways that Atlanta, in the many senses that it is invoked, but particularly when it is a metonym for CDC, is emblematic of the challenges posed by an outbreak investigation across a steep gradient of racialized differences and hierarchies, of its gendered inequalities and exclusions. So in this talk today, which is based on a chapter from a book manuscript in progress, I, I won't be thinking through the common ground shared by these distinct cases, even if Louise, my main interlocutor here, does not be on her own sense of shame about her involvement in not documenting the particular set of events. In fact, as a starting point, I would like to suggest that it would have been illiberal for her to have openly acknowledged the potential racial, gender, and class underpinnings of her failure to conceive of these crimes as historically significant events. For the very same foundations, that is, racialized, gendered, and classed inequalities, have supported a desire to help others through collecting objects that testify to their struggles, their tragedies, and their triumphs. So I also want to think with the CDC's Ebola exhibit and the CDC Museum more generally to address three interrelated questions about the global, global health's origins in and affinities with US public health. First, what is the story that the museum tells about the role of the CDC in outbreak and, by extension, in global health? The objects displayed in the exhibit and the stories behind their selection, their installation and orientation, order museums vis museum visitors' understanding of what the U.S. public health imagines itself to be, and the globe it imagines and constitutes in the name of global health. I argue that despite the fact that public health as a profession comprises a range of fields, expertise, and tasks, the CDC is interpolated primarily as the gold standard for infectious disease outbreak investigations, and as a result, exports a specific model of public health that resembles policing, not simply securitized or militarized notions of health, as I've argued elsewhere. Atlanta and its racial politics is a crucial dimension of this interpolation. Second, the CDC manages its brand identity and market some of its most prominent and widely circulating products in the public-facing work. Epidemic <coughs> Intelligence, and that's the logo for the Epidemic Intelligence Service, <coughs> Health Security, and Field Epidemiology Training. Although the CDC is one of many U.S. health organizations responding to epidemic emergencies in the Global South, it plays a pivotal role in both the U.S. cultural and global health imagination as it works closely with other government agencies. So contagion isn't the only one, right? You've seen Outbreak and uh, The Walking Dead, which is the popular one that people want to see when they go to the museum. Um, and it also, it works with African ministries of health, non-governmental organizations, um, and dur and during the health emergencies. And these roles and relationships are represented in the museum's permanent exhibit, 
the story of CDC, which is located in its basement, in the literal bowels of the institution. So their museum, museum visitors also learn about the broader textual, visual, and spatial narrative about and effectively organizing the CDC's role as a partner in securing and promoting the world's health and the health of the American people. The organization builds its prestige and influence through an imp a U.S. imperial order in which often violent global circulations of capital, scientific knowledge, and expertise are embedded and racialized. And third, the CDC insinuates itself into many facets of public life in the assertion that nearly all things constitute a public health issue and are therefore amenable to public health logics and interventions like this violence issue here. Um, even if the public to whom this idea is addressed is largely unaware of this insinuation. So further, the CDCification of public health, and I know that's awkward, but I'm going there. Um, the expression and expansion of U.S. racial bureaucracy into public health as such can be regarded as transnational and perhaps global phenomenon, as low- and middle-income countries in Africa and Asia form their own versions of the CDC with the aim of being prepared. And this is the logo of the Africa CDC, which was recently uh, started with by the African Union. And, well, it's, it's basically the, the byproduct of the, out, the West African outbreak. Nigeria also has a CDC, but it precedes this, this one. In a recent article, Alison Howell asks us to rethink militarization as a useful descriptor or analytic of contemporary politics. Specifically, Howell suggests that it is not that war is encroaching on peace, and it is not that military is trespassing on the civilian. Rather, martial politics are fundamental to the Constitution and continued production of liberal democracies such as the U.S. This is not direct, directed equally at all parts of the population, but targets those who are constituted as a threat to the nation's strength or civil order. And this is something that I'm also grappling with on this project. The fact that there is no de demilitarized place to return when it comes to public health. That war-like ideas and practices have been central, if not constitutive, to its formation, institutionalization, and professionalization. I'm also reminded of an Argentinian colleague who, upon reading an earlier version of this book, which was a lot about militarization and securitization of, of health responses, she actually put the manuscript down and she said, it never occurred to me that health could not be military, could not be militarized. The military is taken for granted. That's, that's just a part of the thing. And if you know the history of Argentinian public health, you know that to be true. Another colleague who'd been working for the Kinema Government Hospital in Sierra Leone when Ebola hit the area, and it actually was one of the first early hotspots, recoiled with anger as she recounted how public health workers treated their outbreak investigations like police interrogations. Where have you been? Who have you seen? Who have you touched? Suspected but, but unconfirmed cases were sent to wait, await their fates in places called Ebola holding centers a kind of transition area where the uninfected were very likely to become, become infected within a matter of hours, and to witness the rapid decline in deaths of those awaiting test results. So beyond the martial politics, I've also been trying to explain and think through the investigative, the intelligence gathering activities that's also a part and parcel of CDC's practices. Um, and I, I've been referring to CDC as U.S. public health for a reason, which I can discuss in Q&A. So these two dimensions of U.S. public health circulate transnationally via security frameworks, health security frameworks, I should say, field epidemiology training programs, um, which some uh, epidemiologists in Latin America call a factory. Uh, what's the word? I'm trying to, like, um, I won't. I'm really bad at Spanish. My kid, I That's actually what they call the, the, the field epidemiology training program in Guatemala, I think. So um, these, these, it, it seems to me that these security, intelligence, and military policing operations translate not only into overt and official practices during emergencies and in their aftermath, but also in the public health landscapes and everyday public health work. So this includes the CDC Museum, which is one of the US public health's public-facing institutions. This. One of my favorite pictures, I travel with it. It, it should probably be in my wallet. Um, it's Sally Johnson Sirleaf having her temperature taken. She's not being held hostage. Yeah. 
It looks like it though, right? So the David J. Sensor uh, CDC Museum is located on the main campus of the U.S. CDC Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta on Clifton Road. How many people have been there? Ooh. Have you been to the museum? No. You should go to the museum. It's cool. <laughs> but everyone, yeah, so people have been to this, this corner. Um, and this, it's on the northwest corner of a 14-acre plot of land donated uh, to Emory, by Emory University in 1947. The museum opened in 1996 as the Global Health Odyssey in celebration of the centennial Olympic Games in anticipation of the agency's 50th anniversary. The Olympia name, therefore, is likely not ornamental, but an apt description of the organization's aspirations for its viewing public. To wander through the museum is to witness the government agency's many transitions, test of faith in scientific discovery and its application for the public good, and the shifting terrain constituting the global of the organization's spiritual and intellectual quests. I had a little fun with it. I even was reading the, the Odyssey. Um, as I was trying to figure out why would they name it. It's actually not well documented why they did except for this Olympics part. So in this way, it maps onto Atlanta's own aspirations to become an international city that serves as a hub for transportation, commercial, and financial interests in the, in the 90s. The museum's opening in 1996 was also to attract international sightseers traveling to Atlanta to attend the two-week sporting event. Today, the museum attracts tens of thousands each year with an estimated 90,000 visitors. I, I'm skeptical. Um, during the tenure of the Ebola exhibit. The, Atl the Atlanta of that era in the 90s and, and the decade preceding it, as Tony K. Bambara notes, was gone with the wind Atlanta, new international city Atlanta, Atlanta, black mecca of the south, second reconstruction city, home of a bulk of Fortune 500 companies, scheduled host of the World's Fair in the year 2000, proposed site of the World University, and slated to make the top 10 of the world's greatest financial centers. Atlanta, in other words, is imagined as a global hub for finance capital, black political self-determination, cultural production, and exhibition, and international goodwill. In the years after its opening, the curation team put up three to four exhibits every year on the museum's main floor, covering the range of issues addressed by the agency. Refugee health, race, environment, violence, injury prevention, the list goes on. And from time to time, the museum showcases the work of visual artists inspired by public health themes. So you can see paintings that look like germs. <clears throat> Among the exhibits running in the museum's past decade, the Ebola exhibit was the longest standing at 12 months. The museum counts among its audience, mem uh, un an audience international visitors and dignitaries in the field of public health. So they have a, a um, Flickr site that will show like the Liberian Minister of Health walking through the exhibit, things like that. Um, new employees go there, affiliated researchers, members of the general public who are intrigued by the spectacle and dynamics of infectious disease outbreaks. So if you do a, if you look at the Yelp reviews for, or the Google reviews for the CDC museum, they'll not only mention security, they'll be like, why can't I, why isn't there an exhibit on the walking dead? And why can't I wear a space suit? <laughs> it's true. And so, the school-aged youth are also a target audience for the museum's educational outreach activities, with, with special docent-guided tours organized for local school groups. During the summer, the museum offers a disease detective camp for rising high school juniors and seniors as a part of their broader efforts to educate the public about the agency's work in public health. In 2011, the Global Health Odyssey was renamed after David J. Sensor, the, the CDC's longest-serving uh, director. So the CDC's participation in the official response to the e Ebola outbreak marks the agency's largest deployment of staff ever to an outbreak. 1,500 deployments to Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone, 80,000 person days of effort, and a level one emergency operations activation, which is the highest level of emergency. That's 24 hour on call, situation room, everything you've seen on television, right? And this activation began it's pretty much around the time that those two people were flown in to be treated at Emory University Hospital. So once the funding was approved for the exhibit at, later that fall, Louise and her colleagues began a planning process that would take about two years to complete. And the exhibit was scheduled to run from June 2017 to May 2018, but it was extended probably because of the interest, but maybe also to accommodate the visit of the Minister of Health from Liberia. Um, that said, 
it's a very it, it's a very big exhibit. You can see it part of it right here. This is probably like the first third of it in this in this picture. And this this started in August 2014. This collection process. So I talked about security, but I probably didn't. I don't know if I mentioned that you can't just walk into the CDC museum. You can't just like get it, you know, drive up and, and walk in. Like many U.S. government buildings today, and the CDC since it, it opened in the 40s, it has a visible security presence. The museum website prepares visitors by suggesting that they allow additional time to undergo the security protocol. That was the picture here. Um, there's actually a security gate at the beginning. So every visitor's car has to be scanned and searched by security personnel stationed at the kiosk near the entrance. Every visitor must register, sign in, pass through a metal detector. Every visitor's belongings must pass through an x-ray machine. And a security supervisor sits at the front desk um, registering vis visitors on a ledger. Non-citizen adults are required to present a passport. U.S. citizens, a government-issued ID or driver's license. Those who secure admission upon presentation of an ID receive a visitor's badge. Museum visitors are asked to combine their visit and their photographic equipment to designated museum areas. Other areas adjoining the museum, staff offices, for example, are off limits, though restrooms and communications offices are largely unguarded spaces. And I only know that because I, ha I went to go look for Louise and no one stopped me. Um, I visited the museum three times over the course of two years, twice to visit the Ebola exhibit, but I also used to work at the CDC. And was surprised to see that at each visit, despite all these barriers to entry, there were always a few non-employees, those are the people who are wearing visitors' badges, lingering in the lobby or amongst the exhibit's many objects. So in mid-2017, I joined a special curator tour of this uh, Ebola exhibit. And you have to sign up, up, up for it online. This is a part of the sort of display. You can see how big it is. Um, and they usually have like 25 or 30 visitors, so we were all lining up, and Pierre Rollin, um, some of you might have heard of him, or not, <laughs> he's a French-American French medical epidemiologist standing, he's with the curator Louise, who I've, I've already mentioned. And she introduced him as having been born in Algeria, which he quickly corrected. I was born in Morocco when it was a French colony, you know, the bad old days. But I've lived in the U.S. for many years, and I'm a citizen, so that makes me African-American. That was actually, people laughed. I'm not, like, I, I actually, it actually threw me off for a good hour. I was like, I don't know what to do with this. But it actually makes sense if you know a little bit more about the story, and I'm not sure I'm going to get there. So, um, Pierre, the exhibit begins with this title panel, and around the backside of the panel is an orientation to Ebola. There's a timeline of the disease, followed by a timeline of the disease in West Africa, which, in other words, the visitors are made aware of two kinds of temporalities, that which explains the emergence and recognition of the earliest cases of the disease in 1976 in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo and South Sudan, the second which explains the emergence and recognition of the disease in West Africa, where it was widely believed to not have been present before 2014. It would become common knowledge within weeks that this was not true, a paper published in, 24, in September 2014, mostly authored by researchers who would eventually perish in this outbreak, showed that several Sierra Leoneans had gone undiagnosed in previous years. An even earlier paper suggested that Ebola had been identified in Liberia as early as the late 1970s. But it is the Kikwit outbreak of 1995 in the Democratic Republic of Congo that really cements the virus's celebrity status with the proliferation of books, movies, and television series depicting Ebola and Ebola-like outbreaks. So the hot, the, the hot zone is not an example of that, actually. That's the Reston virus. But the other ones, like Contagion and Laurie Garrett's book, The Coming Plague, all and, and there's another book that came out. All of these were very much influenced by the Kikwit outbreak. And Pierre is both best known for his work during that outbreak, where he offered clinical care as a CDC physician and public health support as a field epidemiologist. Now, this is important because during this tour, he wistfully recalled it as an era where they were allowed to be close to patients and affected communities. The agency's role had since become focused on offering technical assistance to ministries in collecting and managing disease data, developing communication strategies, 
and tracing sick people and those who came into close contact with them. This officially circumscribed mode of investigating large-scale outbreaks led some journalists to believe that the CDC employees were largely sequestered in hotels in capital cities, waiting to receive and process data far from the action. Images from the field, with employees wading through um, mud and deep brush, and audiovisual testimonies by CDC workers, however, suggested a much more intimate level of engagement, dissolving the presumed bifurcation between field and office information and data. Um, I kind of wanted to pause there because that, that's sort of an important point in the sense that this is about a question about a liability and what it is that CDC ultimately does. So it, does, it responds primarily on, in the realm of information. And, and when it sees itself in the field, it's not as offering care, but actually in, well, not everyone perceives it this way, but helping data move and circulate. Others see it as an, a moment of extraction. And so it's something worth thinking about where care is actually disarticulated from the mandate of these very large scale responders. So multiple stories about the outbreak's origins also surface in these early sections of the exhibit. A widely circulated image captured by a group of German scientists of bat infested trees um, in Melian du Guinea, an unfolding ecological disaster wrought by resource extraction in three countries. The underfunded, under-resourced health system is vectors for rapid transmission of disease. And they kind of like somehow stuck it all in one section. And this, again, was very interesting to me for reasons. So, but upon seeing the image of the tree, a woman in the group posed a vague question. She said, wasn't there a boy? Does everyone remember the boy? Okay. This, that boy was a toddler named Emil, um, Emil, I can't read his name, Wamunu. Actually, it's Wamunu. It's Wamunu. Um, and he'd become the main character in the Just So story, a, puti a putative patient zero for the epidemic, having, fa having fallen ill in 2013. Pierre's answer to the woman's question was more circumspect about Emile's significance to the story of the epidemic. To show us just how difficult it is to rely on patient reports of their contacts, he counted back generations of disease transmission using the 21-day incubation period as its guide. If the first laboratory-confirmed Ebola tests were reported to WHO in March 2014, he said, and those contacts had contacts, and those contacts had contacts, that would only get us as far back as January 2014. How many of us can say that we remember the sick people we encountered and when we encountered them? Again, I'm reminded of that colleague's account of the epidemic interrogations and detentions taking place at the government health facility. These de details start to go um, awry when people are confronted with the demands of the interrogator and the demands of their own health. Other things about the origin story, the patient zero, the ground zero, the animal vector even, was in question. For although a specific species of bat had been named as the primary reservoir for Ebola, even this has not been confirmed. Fever is the most first and most common sign and symptom of Ebola viral disease. An infrared thermometer aimed at an individual's temple allows quick, seemingly non-intrusive method and deceptively easy to read interface for measuring an individual's body temperature. How many people have actually ever encountered this thing? Has it, is it right usually? <laughs> it's like never, if you try to do this with your kid, you're like, it doesn't, it doesn't work. I've actually been shot with that a few times. I still don't. Um, but anyway, there are three, I don't know if you notice this, there are three digital uh, or infrared forehead thermometers on, in this exhibit. During the tour, Pierre pointed out that the thermometer often gave inconsistent or plain wrong measurements, unlike the traditional mercury thermometers that might be held in the mouth or the rectum. But he also suggested that the infrared thermometer had become an unreliable shortcut for gauging threat levels, a poor substitute for spending an extended amount of time in endemic areas, talking to people, observing people's condition. He gave the example of having spent enough time in a village to see who was running to the bathroom, for diarrhea is also a common symptom of Ebola. Then he would say, that's how I spy on them, that's how I know. Pierre again waxed nostalgic for the days of the grounded intimate field work. So while the infrared thermometer might not perform the single task for which it is designed, it is an otherwise politically useful prop, 
The object served to mediate and surveil individual movements at border crossings. And in fact, CNN had a whole segment about the check the checkpoints, and they sent a reporter to go through the checkpoint in Kitama, which, you know, it's interesting. Um, and they're, they're set up at border crossings, checkpoints, roadblocks. It gave the appearance of political control, technical acuity, scientific accuracy even. Um, and I showed you that picture of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf having hers taken for, having her temperature taken with the, an American, I don't know if she was an American soldier, but I think she was. Um, in the display right here, this is a member of the Sierra Leonean military holding thermometer to the face of a near half open car window. We can only see her darkened profile and wisps of straight hair, but she appears to be a white NGO worker peering out, smiling from the window of the company Land Cruiser. The photographer of the scene is also inside the vehicle. I'm not sure what to make of this yet. This is why I'm hoping the Q&A, but every picture struck me as um, one worth thinking about. So there's a, an actual acquisition process for some of these photos that I might also discuss if someone's actually interested. So it took us about an hour to get through this first third of the exhibit's 21 sections. Well, we seem conscious of the fact that we've spent most of our time like on this kind of stuff, you know, looking at the baubles and, and trinkets of epidemic response. So she looked at Pierre and she said, you think of your favorite spot, I'm going to think of mine, and let's get everyone over there. So she, this is where she brought it. You're supposed to be like, because <gasps> that's supposed to be the effect. I'm joking. That's what, that was. Um, <laughs> does anyone know what this thing is? Take, take a second. It looks like a situation room. It probably came from the situation room. Probably. I can. Anyone know what? Yeah. Like contact tracing. It's contact tracing. That's why, that's why you're here. I can tell. <laughs> you're wondering how she got this here, right? Because this is actually from Freetown. This actual whiteboard is from Freetown. I can also explain and tell you a little bit about that in the Q&A. But I'm going to tell you why. I, I found it really interesting that she stopped there. So the leftmost square says index case, MK, male, 30, M35, male, 35, onset, 6-6, six, six, is in June 6th. Um, ooh, I always forget these. Um, recover, I think, is what he, he did. Um, and, and survived, recovery and survival, 6-16. Uh, yes, that's what green means. So I, I call him Muhammad Kamara a lot because that just... So the arrows sprouted from the square in the direction of other squares, and these are all relationships, right? These are neighbor, aunt, friend, daughter, granddaughter. It's actually really moving. I happen to know the story behind this cluster, but I can't share it because I don't think it's... Um, it, it's, it's personal, right? Um, it's somebody's... It's actually somebody's... This is someone's health situation. Um, so a legend in the upper right corner tells you, you know, green square equals survivor, black square equals died, red is swab positive, and so on and so forth. Isn't this the most spectacular piece, Louise exclaimed? I looked around and I scanned other spaces. I could not tell if they agreed. Many were still like you, like, what is this? <laughs> Puzzling over its contents. After all, it hadn't been constructed for us, but for the disease detectives working the case. But it was exhibited for us. It's mounted in a shadow box, protected by glass. Um, and there's something, I think, arresting about the whiteboard and the isolation in that place. I think on the other side is, um, I think it's a bunch of, uh, actually, I know exactly what's on the other side of it. It's, it's those um, sticks that come out of the ground for drying boots and gloves that have been used for. So, and so that's what's on the other side of it. Um, the sparse miniaturized diagram, so, so, is, so this is what it looks like cleaned up. This is the cluster. This is one of the last clusters in, in Sierra Leone, in Magazine Wharf, which if you know anything, anybody know about Magazine Wharf in Freetown? So it's one of these places that um, is considered a slum. It's low, very low lying, so it often floods. And it's, it's basic, but it's very well known in this sort of NGO community. Like you go, oh, well, I had to go to Magazine Wharf today to go, you know, follow up on child, well, child visits or something like that. And
and so it's it's actually significant that this was one of the last um, that it was one of the last uh, clusters. So in more than one interview with me and the others, Louisa described the whiteboard as extremely moving. She told me that it had brought one epidemiologist who had been working on this specific disease cluster and who encountered people in the chart to tears. Even if its contents did not move members of the tour, or even if it seemed cryptic to some of us, the whiteboard might have been immediately recognizable to avid consumers of police procedural dramas, at least it was to me, and epidemic thrillers. In the, in the latter genre, the whiteboard is a medium through which epidemiologists communicate their ep expertise about patterns and dynamics of tr disease transmission. In the former, an analyst or detective uses the board to keep track of relationships among individuals, suspects, victims, accomplices, and the bodies of evidence linking them to a crime. The disease cluster map was a chart depicting and organizing bits of information collected from clinical records, investigators' accounts, and contact tracers' notebooks into relationships of affinity, lineage, and descent. The temporalities of viral animal-human-host relationships were synced to a series of disease events. Many of the individuals whose identities are condensed into squares are related to each other. Some encountered each other as co-workers, neighbors, in the or in the hospital. Others appear to cluster around a pregnant woman going into labor and eventually giving birth. So if you look at it very closely, there's a, a baby who's a part of this chain. For the epidemiologist working in the emergency operations center in Freetown, this object conjured up powerful emotions, perhaps more importantly, for the sake of museology, because Louise is a museologist and not a public health professional, she continued to remind me. The image represented the last of the major disease clusters during the, Sierra, the outbreak in Sierra Leone. The diagram's significance extended beyond its depiction of the magazine Warp Disease Cluster. It condenses and crystallizes what it means to do public health. It demonstrates the transnational reach of public health's precepts, its techniques, its practices, its laborers, as well as many ways public health affixes to organizations and institutions across space and time. But it's only if you ask <laughs> the question. The whiteboard diagram functions as a technology that both enables intervention and exhibition, refiguring the boundaries between the representation of scientific facts and cultural artifacts. The whiteboard enacts the object relations linking imaginaries of health to imaginaries of policing. As synecdoche of the operations center, it helps to orient the strategy for mobilizing boots on the ground, shoe leather detectives, such that they can reach every point of contact among kin, neighbors, and colleagues. And if I were being creative more so, I probably would put up the EIS picture again where there's a footstep on the globe. Someone actually surpri was surprised that that was really the, the EIS logo. I mean, I don't know if it's because it's just bad graphic design or if it just seems a little not subtle. <laughs> or both. This is always my favorite, and I really I have a lot to say about it, but I'll skip it. I'll just say that this is the upgraded version of the T-shirt. Like if you worked in West African uh, health programs in the '90s or aughts, you were you had to give away a T-shirt. Now you have to give away vests. So, um, which again is something that's worth talking about at some point. So the story of the CDC, let's get back to the basement, because I'm, I'm, I had to go back there. I kept thinking, I haven't, I've been to this Ebola thing a lot, but I haven't been, or enough, and I, I feel like I haven't been back to the story of the CDC. Um, this is, if, if you haven't, if you've actually been to the museum, no one has been to the museum. There's one, one person, two people have been to the museum. You know the bottom part is like, hurrah public health. We eradicated smallpox. We started in West Africa. Hooray, iron lungs. No more of those. Polio is eliminated from, from the hemisphere. Um, there's a little lesson in ethics in the syphilis, Tuskegee syphilis trial. It's a lesson in ethics. It's not, nothing else. Um, I know. It, it's, I had to explain this to my first year students yesterday. <laughs> it was actually very alarming for them. Um, this is a guinea worm. Erratic. Oh wait, no, that's river. That's river virus. Um, sorry. So th this, it's very much a triumph. It's the triumph of public health. There's the AIDS wall that comes on this other side. Um, but if you were to kind of like, if you weren't paying attention it, it, to 
what it's trying to tell you is trying to tell you that even though you're here for the disease detection stuff, there's other stuff that we do. We do cardiovascular disease. They have measuring, they're measuring cups that show you how much you should eat. We run laboratory services. We just, you know, we discover mechanisms, various micro level biological mechanisms. We do this, we do that. Yet. <laughs> Um, but it's also, uh, yeah, so the thing that I'm still grappling with and, and would love to have a conversation about is how this level is actually the CDC of health, of health and the health implication of everything. Um, and so, and the, the way that I've been trying to think about this beyond this part, so a lot of this is war area malarial stuff, and then the disease detectives, which I don't know why they started calling them that, but I think it's because Epidemic Intelligence Service sounds too spy-like. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds a little bit too narky. <laughs> they still, yeah, people still wear their uniforms, it's okay. Um, here's the stuff. I told you, but this one is the one that keeps kept bringing me back. What are they building the CDC unification and the health unification of? What is sort of at the foundation of a lot of this stuff? And this one kept bringing me back. And I have already mentioned that this is, this is about the Atlanta, the missing and murdered children of Atlanta. I think I just want to read this because I feel like you kind of have to, from 1979 to 81, Atlanta was gripped by a series of unsolved child murders and a number of missing children cases, known locally and nationally as the missing and murdered children. Most of the victims were boys between the ages of 7 and 14, and all were African American. And I'll stop actually after this next sentence. As concerned as other Atlantans, CDC scientists offered to investigate these incidences of violence by using classic techniques of epidemiological t detective work. Actually, no, I should read the rest because it's important. Not an attempt to identify the killer or killers. They studied and set out to determine common risk factors among the victims. The goals were to predict which of Atlanta's other children might be likely targets and to recommend preventive measures in high-risk communities. <laughs> so this process actually catalyzed the establishment of CDC's Violence Epidemiology Branch in 1983, and then by 1992 there's a, a, been a, a Center for Injury Prevention and Control. Um, so of course when I saw this, like I couldn't get this out of my head, I tried. <laughs> I kept going, this can't go in the Ebola book, but I think it actually is significant because it keeps coming back. I actually looked at this, this is a JAMA article. So this, if you actually read, so the, it's a very short article. And I actually want to end here because I, this is where I really want to, want to be able to talk about the implications of thinking through the, at the racial reasoning here. So I've read this article quite a few times, and I'll start with the methods. Um, you see here it says this epidemiological uh, analysis of cluster. So basically, at this time, we had we didn't have violence, these violence prevention people. So some of these people were like diarrheal disease experts. Um, how many, has anyone ever investigated a, a, like a diarrheal disease outbreak? I, I don't know if you remember that. You, yeah, you, you know, you, you, I mean, I'm gonna dumb it down and just say, the church picnic, everybody, you know, there, there's a church picnic, everybody has diarrhea. Um, who ate the potato salad, right? You get a list of everybody who was there, you find out if they had symptoms between a certain date, and then you kind of, and you work your way back to what they ate. And then you're like, ah, the culprit was the Hormel ham, or whatever, right? <laughs> I know, that was my favorite class. So, imagine doing this for children who were killed or went missing. Imagine saying, you know, the police aren't doing enough here, so we're going to step in. At this point, the Atlanta police had called in um, a psychic. I wish, actually, I should have put the picture up. They, put, they called in detectives from other cities. One of the guys was in Beverly Hills Cop. Beverly Hills Cop. He was a real, he was actually the captain. He was, I, I probably spent too much time watching television, but he was actually Eddie Murphy's boss in the film. Um, but the, but that's, but this is how big this thing was. And so, but when I started looking at the methods, I was like, oh, that's interesting. They actually are, they don't care about the killer. They're actually trying to figure out who the, 
what the profile of the child is. So that's the first thing. But if you look deeper and say, well, how did they do that? How long did it take? Who, who actually carried out those interviews? Who went to those families? So they had a, it's a case control study. They said, okay, here are the kids who are about the same age, living in the same neighborhood, weren't kidnapped, weren't killed. And then we're going to pick, go to those families that have children that were missing or murdered. And we're going to compare them and see which one, which of those things, you know, have a higher likelihood or, or not, right? So the questions are actually, but the questions are also interesting. They ask them about the children's sexual tendencies. They, they um, make assessments about the economic status of the house, of the household, looking at the quality of the furniture, how it smells, all of these things. So they actually kind of, and they say this. I also wondered, who, 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 could have, who did this work? Who visited these homes? They were public health nurses. I believe they were black public health nurses, actually, who were sent into these homes. But at this time, by the time the CDC was involved, families that they were asking these questions of had been interrogated multiple times. And so what they, of course, found is that the child who goes out to buy cigarettes after eight is the one who, but all of these other families have stopped sending their children out at all because they're afraid that their kids are going to be kidnapped. And it's obvious if you're reading this that this is why the, the evidence is so strong. But what's also very interesting about it is they ultimately, and so you'll notice that the title is Epidemic, the Epidemiological Analysis of a Cluster of Homicides. They ultimately only prove that there was a cluster of homicides. You get what I'm saying here? The whole point was just to say, yes, you're not crazy. Black children are going missing and being murdered at higher rates than would normally be expected. And this is 1984 that this article came out. There's a three-year gap. And we're not talking about the same kind of peer review process we have now where it takes forever for stuff to come out. <laughs> Though I'm sure that's a part of it as well. And so one of the things I've been grappling with is, like, <laughs> how is it that a whole, I mean, this is the origin story of a center, though. This is not simply a story about, like, look at what we were able to do and help. They didn't really help, actually. Someone was arrested, but it wasn't because, you know, aha, children who are trusting and go out at 9 o'clock at night are, 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 are more likely to get taken. But, so I guess what I'm getting at here is, and what I'm struggling with as I'm moving forward with this, this chapter in the book, which is how I keep getting pulled back to this but also how I keep getting pulled back to this as a foundational case or account of institution building. One of actually one of many that deals with essentially black children, um, if, I'm, if I'm being honest, and some black, and black men with Tuskegee. So how, are, how am I trying to, what, what brought me here was Louise saying, I wasn't going to let that happen again. Not the crime itself, but the crime of remembering or not remembering, of not collecting, of not rapidly responding to remember, which to me is a very odd but intriguing way to think about what this ultimately says about sort of how public health is operating and how it's operating internationally and how it constructs its global health or safeguard for the world or safeguard for the American people. So I'm going to stop there. And Hope, hope to hear really <laughs> interesting questions. Thank you. What do you prefer? No, I, I will. I will I'm, I'm happy to field my own. Okay. It's fine. Uh, uh, got about 15 minutes or so. Oh, I talk too much. <laughs> so we have two questions. Yeah. So we start. Shall we start? Sure. Yeah. 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 I, this was, this was great, and, I, and it's, it's really interesting to sort of think about, in some ways, kind of employing this, you know, sort of public healthy kind of approach to even sort of recovering and remembering or sort of archiving particular sort of, mm -hmm. you know, objects, thoughts, or you know, ideas, um, which is which is fascinating. And so I was just sort of thinking, you know, through your talk, sort of about how 
you're sort of sliding across these various scales, like you know, in Atlanta, global public health, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had kind of just a very simple question, and I think you, you hit it, but 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 I, I would just be very curious to see mm -hmm. to how you respond to it, which is, I mean, in essence, you know, sort of, why does the CDC have a museum? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a very beautiful museum, but you know, you know what I mean? Like, taxpayer dollars are going to pay for this that maybe not a whole lot of people are right. going to, and that it's actually really hard to even, you know, sort of access, right? So, right. so, 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 you know, why, why does this thing exist? I mean, what purpose, what purpose is it so, so other than sort of, you know, kind of crafting how we understand uh, uh, it's sort of the institutional narrative, right? Right. What right. else? What else? I mean, that's clearly what you're where, where you're sort of right. talking about. What else is it is it doing, and why is it important? Like, why does this? I love that. Why they I love this, that question. You know. Yeah. I, so no, I, I, I absolutely love that question because it's a question that. So it's actually at the root of Louise's discussion with me as well, right? So she says, "Oh, the, one of the reasons we kept talking is she goes, oh, idea. This Ebola exhibit made people believe in my mission." You know, she was like, no, but never, before people were like, why the hell is this thing here, right? Um, and so, at, but I don't know if it's because of the fact that everyone contributed artifacts. I'm not sure if it's because people felt, felt themselves to be a part of the story. Um, but I do know that being a part of the story is actually at the center of the justification for the museum, which is to say, <clears throat> um, if you're, so, I've talked to a few people who've worked, I, I've been, I think I went to this when it was Odyssey, actually. But I've talked to people who've since been onboarded at CDC and they say, oh, this is just part of my orientation. But this is, oh, this is just a thing. So to some extent it's about enlisting, like kind of enrolling people into the idea, the sort of heroic triumph of public health. Because the fact of the matter is, is public health is a little bit like, if it's working, nobody seems to notice, right? Um, and so you kind of have to say things like, the reason we don't have X is because we did Y. So there, um, there's that. And the other piece is, yeah, a lot of people can't get into it, but they try. Um, and, it, and there are all these other ways that it circulates as the CDC circulates as an as a object of interest, which is like, that's why I was saying The Walking Dead, Contagion, not Outbreak because that's the U.S. Amrit, that's U.S. Amrit. But no, actually, his wife is CDC. So, <laughs> um, but it's 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 just I think it's like a sort of standard. It's a nice conservative way to do the work of public relations. And if you look at sort of early health communications work about the CDC museum, it is about educating. It is fundamentally a part of the, the CDC mission to educate the public about public health. And this is a very conservative, circumscribed, well-understood way of doing that. Legitimate. It's legitimate. Um, and it's gotten bigger, so it wasn't always this nice. Um, but I think as a part of a communications strategy, it becomes, it sort of grows into something. I mean, I was talking to a student of, of mine who um, is studies museums as her work, and, and she said, you mean there's a woman who, who gets, has curator as her title, who gets a government, you know, gets GS, you know, she actually was like, there's a line for her. That's kind of awesome. So, yeah, I mean, it's, and so, but anyway, there's, they also archive a lot of stuff, but it, they're based in the Office of Communications, and that's, that's their thing, and so it's about enrolling this sort of group of people, it's educating the public, um, it's, and they struggle, they do. Um, they, you know, they have every, before she could even put that Ebola exhibit up, she had to, re, you know, revise and refine, and, and she was censored, she said she was censored. You know, a lot of the stuff that she does is, um, she calls it slightly subversive. You know, she does little things that she can stick in if she wants to do a little side act. People will refuse, will help her write these captions, but then won't put their names on them because they're afraid of the political repercussions of having their name on controversial things. But the fact of the matter is, is it has, that function. I, I don't know if I over answered or under answered. Let me just say a quick thing about that, about museums and federal buildings. Mm -hmm. You find something similar about the FBI and the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's basically it's, the, it's a justification for your money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like it. <laughs> oh, wait, I think, well. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your talk. It was really interesting. And I have a couple of questions. 
some of them are circulating around this idea that as black being disease mm -hmm. and the idea like black as disease. And the reason why I'm thinking about this is because were there any other exhibits, parts of the exhibit, that talked about violence with any other group of people? No. Um, no. <laughs> I mean, no. So, no. Was there another part to that question? Because, well, the reason why I'm thinking about that is because part of me is thinking, okay, this could be one example, but there are other examples of violence and disease, then one could argue that they really start to study violence, right? And while blackness might be the basis, that there are other ways they're thinking about this. But if not, yeah. then for me, mm -hmm. that amplifies this relationship between blackness, violence, and then in some subconscious way, criminality, right? Mm -hmm. While the crime... Right. While the children are not committing the crime, they're being affiliated with criminality right, in this absolutely. way that doesn't ever make the actual criminal accountable for what's going on. As you stated, this is not even the goal, right? right. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious if there was any other line of conversation about that. So yeah, there is. Um, oh, this picture. I took it because I, I just, it broke, <laughs> it, it got me. So um, the, it's actually really, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so actually this timeline, the earliest instance of, of discussion of violence is actually intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. um, but they're looking, so they, I think they used um, homicide records at first to kind of see how much of the, how many of those homicides were intimate partner uh, or domestic at this point, what have been domestic uh, violence. So they were starting, they actually dipped their toe into Violence by talking about yeah intimate partner violence, but starting from file crime like crimes uh, files that they had about crimes and kind of tracing them back, and they published a study I want to say it was in seventy four that basically said oh people are more this so the statistic that you always hear is that you're more likely to be killed by someone you know comes out of that earliest that early work. They didn't have very but that didn't help them get. Prom, like prominence, like this was just sort of like, oh, that's it. That was a great report. Cool, peace out. Whatever, right? Um, this it's it's this thing that actually mobilized, according to their own timeline. Like if you read any official timelines about violence, how the Violence Center got created, they actually use this. This it starts with intimate partner violence, and then it goes, but it's this case working with the police that kind of enabled and enlarged the possibility. So it, they see, and I don't know if it's just because they see chronology as, you know, the chronology guides their, their thinking, um, but I think it, it probably helped tip the scales. So that's actually how they present it. Um, so and that's something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what's interesting there, because when you, when you started the presentation with that imagery of the person coming into the United States right. and her concern about that, right? Both. All of these things for me are thinking around the idea of harm. Mm -hmm. So, like this, even the idea of like harm reduction, right? But while she's specifically thinking about this archival erasure or silencing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The implication is that there's some kind of harm that's being caused, right? Yes. That there's some kind of right. harm that's occurring here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm just I was just curious about these other contexts of violence and right. how to situate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny that you say that because one of the ways this initially started was my preoccupation with what I was calling immunological thinking, which is that if we could only force the if we can force the memory, if we can only force the memory, we can prevent the thing, and whatever the thing is. And so in this way, it's like we want to we want to remember so we don't forget to remember. It's almost it, it's a very odd um, kind of displacement that I, I kept seeing, but this idea is like never again, never again what? Never again will we forget that we should have remembered? Um, and so, the, but there's, that language comes up again in, with Ebola, which is that there's a, a kind of a genocidal imperative that they're trying to, to push back by just the, the act of, of, of formal commemoration. And so I was kind of stuck there and I was like, oh, that's, that's weird, I'm not sure what to do with it. So I think what you're hearing, too, is the trace of that original thing that got me wondering why it was that this needed a rapid response. Why this was the rapid response and not the 
actual intervention in West Africa or something like that. Um, so that that was sort of my. There was there's a lot going on in August 2014 as you might remember. So, um, yeah. I I wanted to ask a question that is related to this relationship between public health and crime mm -hmm. that Grace raised as well, and that seems to be a theme throughout your talk. Um, and it's interesting because very often we look to public health as being an alternative to a criminal response yes. in the case of drug addiction, for example, or as you said, domestic violence, um, abortion is another example, um, gun violence. Uh, this is a public health issue, it right. shouldn't be criminalized. Exactly. And so it's interesting, I think, then to think about ways in which public health issues are criminalized. Right. But, I, but I wondered if you'd say more about what it is about public health that is that connects it to criminalization. You know, as opposed to being an opposite and better approach than criminalization. I, I know it's, a, it's kind of a big question, yeah, maybe. Really but big what, question. What is it about? I have, I guess, I've been thinking it's because it. is there something wrong with public health? Or is it just the way the CDC and and, uh, and U.S. institutions do right. public health? Right. So that's what I that's what I'm trying to figure out too. I'm like, is it a U.S. That's why also the Argentinian perspective struck me. Mm -hmm. And then I read a book about Argentinian public health, and then I was like, oh, well, of course, it was. You know, they were actual street agents enforcing the cleanliness, mm -hmm. the laws of cleanliness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm actually wondering if, it, it, if it's an artifact of the American form or the U.S. form, or even the American of you know, when I, this, this part of the world's versions of public health, um, that it emerged out of a particular kind of uh, political economy of movements. So I think that might actually be it. I think it might actually be a regional sort of cultural, a regional cultural phenomenon. That, that's something I'm entertaining, which is why I'm calling CDC U.S. public health. Mm -hmm. um, because I noticed that when I talked to, say, even the Austrians, there was a different, just a different way of thinking about public health in this place. Mm -hmm. um, that said, um, part it was that um, one thing that sparked my thinking about this was when one of my friends, who actually was the head of the CDC, getting response for Ebola, he said. Oh, well, this other guy in Sierra Leone wanted to do um, this military, or no, the president of Guinea wanted to do what Sierra Leone did, which was to militarize it. And I told him, hey, no, I don't want people to, I don't want any violence. We're going to do a public health approach. That's actually what he said. We're going to do a public health approach. And so the, the village is still quarantined, but people can go in and out to farm. People can still, um, as long as they take their temperature before and after they come in and all of these things. And I said, and so I said, oh, I said, Ben, but the quarantine still, you know. So I was like, your your approach does sound less extreme, less violent. Yeah. Um, but we have to also remember that there are elements of the response that are, as much as I hate to say, always already <laughs> militarized or securitized that you have to think about, particularly in places that have experiences with certain forms of violence by the state. And Guinea would be one of them. Sierra Leone, it's kind of 50-50. Liberia, we know that there was an actual, like a, a military police civilian battle over the lines of quarantine, also in August 2014, also which happened to be the same week as Ferguson. So it was like this whole, I remember like all the stuff happening, I, I was not sleeping. Like I was basically checking Twitter and all my email every day because I was, I was like, what is going on? Why is all of this stuff happening? Um, so yeah, I would say I'm, I'm entertaining the possibility that it was US specific or at least America specific. I'm entertaining the idea that there are some origin stories that suggest that public health has, these, has this potential or elective affinity with certain forms of, of security and violence issues, but I'm not, you know, I want, I'm not sure I'm ready to say that public health itself is extremely violent and coercive, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is